Peace be with you and welcome everyone to our Voices for Peace event for 2022. Blessed are the peacemakers. This is our sixth event since 2018. Our aim has been to explore the roots of Christian nonviolent resistance to violence, war, and injustice. Our desire is that each of us might strengthen our commitment to peace and join our voices with others to act for peace. Those of you who spent time in the waiting room were able to hear two fine John Brooks songs. John has graciously allowed us to use his music for several Voices for Peace events. I believe John's with us this evening. You can find out more about John and his order his music at www.johnbrooks, that's j-o-n-brooks.ca. On the sidebar to your screen, you'll find a chat function. If you want, take a moment and let us know where you're viewing from. You can also type in a question or a comment. It takes collaboration and creativity to bring together a truly diverse group of speakers from Europe, Canada, and the United States for an event like this. So before we commence, I want to thank the Henri Nouwen Society, Citizens for Public Justice, the Brazilian Center for Peace, Justice, and the Integrity of Creation, the Canadian Council of Churches, Religions for Peace, the International Thomas Merton Society, and the Church of the Redeemer in Toronto. Without their partnership, their participation and their guidance, this event would not take place. As we prepared for this evening, over 150 of you submitted questions. Many of them carried a sense of urgency, a sense of struggle to find a way to deal with both what is happening in your own hearts and in the world around you. It is our desire that the discussions this evening will help you find answers, encourage you to take action, and help build hope. Not a hope rooted in naive optimism, but a hope grounded in Christ's resurrection call to peace. Having conversations to build a culture of peace is always important, but even more so this year, as we witness an invasion of the Ukraine that included a threat of nuclear weapons. And even just today, the shooting of 14 children in an elementary school in Texas in the United States. This made us want to open this conversation to as many people as possible, so there was no fee for registration. There is, of course, a cost to organizing and hosting these conversations. You're welcome, if you are able, to assist with the costs. Just click on the Donate button on this page. You'll find the Donate link if you scroll down, along with the bios of each for each of our guests. The Henri Nouwen Society will issue a receipt for each donor. Thank you. I want to welcome Canadian Council of Churches President Das Sidney. We want to commence today with prayer and Das is going to lead us. Das, thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's my privilege to bring greetings on behalf of the Canadian Council of Churches and our esteemed General Secretary Peter Notoboom. Uh, the council, in case people don't know of it, represents 85% of Christians in Canada and 26 different denominations. And we are pleased to join and add our voice to this call and prayer for peace. We are proud, of course, to belong to a country known more for peace than for war, but we have a lot of work to do. We are not the original inhabitants of this land of Canada, Turtle Island, as it was labeled in some First Nations traditions was occupied by indigenous people going back to 15 to 20,000 years BC, common era. When we work and pray for peace, we have to start in our own backyard and acknowledge that we have done a grievous wrong to the First Nations and we are committed to travel on that path that leads to reconciliation and peace, friendship and love. Today, we are also focusing on our war-scarred world, where suffering is magnified and peace is a rare and elusive creature, but within our collective grasp. And so let us turn to God in prayer and offer our thoughts, our petitions to him. Let us pray together. 
Oh God, we come before you as members of a broken and fractured world. We confess to you our sins of omission and commission. We confess that too often we've been part of the problem and added fuel to the fire of violence and war. You have said to us that peacemakers are blessed, but we have stood idly by when desperation for the very basics of life, food, water, health care, for themselves and for their children, has led to war and the rise of militancy. We deplore and lament the greed of some who desire more than their fair share of the resources of our world. We choose to forget that so much of our own wealth is built on the extraction of resources and unthinking possession of someone else's treasure. Oh God, how we grieve over war in all its manifestations and expressions in highly developed and industrialized countries or those developing nations below or near the equator. We remember the human cost in extreme suffering and the millions who are displaced and rendered as refugees with no home or state. We lament the ruin brought to our earth and threat to food security. We are deeply concerned for the survival of our own planet in the face of a nuclear arsenal which can kill us many times over. Oh God, we pray for peace in the largest and most recent and tragic war in Europe, in Ukraine. And we pray for other areas of war. We pray for the people of Ethiopia, Tigray and Sudan, and the conditions of near famine under which they live. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, which is on the brink of bankruptcy. We pray for Taiwan and the threats to world peace in the South China Sea. We pray for the people in the Middle East, Iran, Yemen, Israel, and the fragmented voices of the Palestinians, whereas in all war, the innocent pay the highest price. We pray for Haiti, tormented by natural disasters and political crises, and for peace and goodwill in the midst of ethnic strife and hatred in Myanmar. We know there cannot be sustainable peace without justice, no sacrificial efforts for peace without compassion, no stemming of the tide of greed without Christ spirit alive in our hearts. Help us, O oh God, to be peacemakers for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Das. I'm honored to introduce my dear friend, Robert Ellsberg. Robert is the publisher and the editor-in-chief of Orbis Books, son of well-known 1970s whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. Robert himself has, from his youth, lived an, a commitment to peace and social justice issues. At 19, he dropped out of college to be a part of the Catholic Workers' Movement. And by the time he was in his early 20s, he was for two years the managing editor of the Catholic Worker. It was a, an important time in his life, obviously forming him in a, in a wonderful way. Um, clearly, Dorothy Day had a profound influence on this young radical because from what he witnessed in the way she lived out her faith, he became a Catholic. After five years, he returned to college and he finished his degree in uh, religion and in literature at Harvard. And then he went on to get his Master's of Divinity at the Harvard School of Divinity. Robert is um, a wonderful writer, an award-winning writer, and a writer who writes spiritually inspiring books, books for the past many decades. I'm just going to name a few that are my favorites. All Saints, Daily Reflections on Saints, Prophets and witnesses for our time. The Saints Guide to Happiness, Practical Lessons in the Life of the Spirit, and then Blessed Among All Women, Women Saints, Prophets and Witnesses for Our Time. Robert has edited and published books by Dorothy Day, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Fritz Eichenberg, 
Gregory Baum, uh, Carlo Caretto, uh, Flannery O'Connor, and Henry Nouwen. I mean, the recent one that he drew from Henry Nouwen's works uh, won the 1920, won the 2021 Global Gold Medal for Ministry from the Illumination Christian Book Awards. At Orbis, Robert is part of the tradition of publishing books that matter. So many of these books have addressed the theme of peacemaking by authors such as Thomas Merton, Bishop Desmond Tutu, Thich Nhat Hanh, John Deere, Jim Forrest, and many others. Because of his commitment to publish the important works of peace and social justice, we invited Robert Ellsberg to speak to us at this special gathering of Voices for Peace. Robert chose the theme for the, from the words of Jesus, from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Please join me in welcoming Robert Ellsberg to this gathering of peace seekers. Thank you, Robert, for coming. Thank you very much, Karen, and everyone joining us uh, this evening. Uh, in one sense, the subject of my presentation this evening could not be more timely with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the subject of war and peace is very much on our minds and hearts. And yet the timing of this presentation has filled me with a certain anxiety. I am not on the front lines where people are making life and death choices about how to respond to aggressive violence. It's hard to sit in safety and talk about peacemaking while bombs are falling somewhere else and millions of people are fleeing their homes. So the very subject can sound naive, unrealistic or insensitive. And in that sense, the timing of this talk might seem very untimely, but of course that raises a different question. Is the message of the gospel, is the teaching of Jesus only for those times when it doesn't seem impractical, unrealistic, or naive? Is there, is there actually any such time? I've read all the pages of questions that were submitted in advance of this presentation, and that increased my anxiety because Many of you have very good practical questions. What should the Ukrainian people do? What should the rest of the world do? What is the relevance of the gospel in the face of such aggression? These are very good questions, and I, I don't actually have very definite answers. Instead, I mostly have other questions. The primary question I want to address is the possibility that Jesus came to propose a very different kind of logic, a different way of seeing and understanding reality. It was a perspective that contrasted dramatically with the values of his world. And because our world is not really all that different, it contrasts with our reality as well. And if that troubles us, well, maybe it should trouble us. It troubles me. But if we call ourselves Christians, perhaps it means that we are also called to see things from a different perspective. And if that is so, it raises the question of how after 2000 years, we could have so failed to get the point and whether it is not too late to try again. Perhaps the most systematic account of this different perspective occurs in the Sermon on the Mount. Six times in his sermon, Jesus repeats the refrain, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist one who is evil, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. People don't hate their enemies because the law tells them that they should. It's, it's an attitude deeply ingrained in human nature. And so when Jesus says to love your enemy, he's proposing a, a revolution in values, a way of looking at the world that utterly breaks with the logic of justified violence, retaliation, and retribution. It's like some kind of alternative physics that defies the laws of gravity. But the Sermon on the Mount begins with an even more condensed version of this message, a series of blessings, the so-called Beatitudes, that outline the values and attitudes that should characterize Jesus' disciples. Pope Francis has called the Beatitudes a Christian's identity card, suggesting that it is precisely in the living of these values above all that one can recognize the distinctive features of Christianity. And he acknowledges that sometimes these beatitudes flow against the tide of the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
Blessed are the pure of heart, blessed are the merciful. And finally, the theme of my presentation, blessed are the peacemakers. Each of these has a personal dimension. We can think of people who have embodied these beatitudes, but they're not simply a list of qualities that make someone especially nice. They also rep represent values that stand in vivid contrast to the prevailing values and ethos of our world. That was dramatically the case in the context in which Jesus was living, an occupied colony with the Roman Empire, a world that literally worshipped power, that made a fetish of cruelty and violence and disdained anything weak or powerless. In the midst of that world, Jesus outlined a, a completely different set of values, values that made absolutely no sense in terms of the value structure of his time. Those who tried to embody such values would seem like aliens in their world, citizens of a different country, speaking a language that sounded like nonsense. Our world is not so different. Blessed are the meek. What does that mean in a culture that prizes power or celebrity, winning, being number one? Blessed are those who mourn. What does that mean in what Pope Francis calls a culture of indifference, in which the mass suffering of strangers or the extinction of fellow creatures doesn't affect us? Yet we've become so accustomed to this litany of beatitudes that it neither disturbs nor challenges us. Rather than serving as an identity card that distinguishes followers of Jesus from the world at large, the Beatitudes, like so many of his teachings, have been privatized and stripped of any social consequence. So that one can truly say on the subject of war and violence, for instance, that Christians aren't that easily distinguished from their non-Christian neighbors. And in that context, what are we to do with blessed are the peacemakers? What does that mean? In America, for many people, it, it basically means a good guy with a gun. You may have seen Monty Python's film, The Life of Brian, which follows the adventures of a hapless character whose life happens to coincide with the life of the actual Jesus. In one scene, Brian finds himself on the outskirts of a crowd, straining to hear Jesus delivering the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say? Someone asks, blessed are the cheese makers. Well, someone helpfully explains that. I think he must be referring to some kind of metaphorical cheese, but that's not actually that far away from the way most of us hear the Beatitudes. Surely Jesus was talking about some kind of metaphorical peace or simply a pious sentiment we invoke on Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Not the kind of peace that means getting in the way of war and violence, not the kind of peacemaking that might get you in trouble, but that wasn't always so. In the early centuries of the church, the word peacemaker might well have served as a synonym for Christian. In that era, followers of Jesus were distinguished by the refusal to kill or study war, and many paid a heavy price for that commitment. Is it a coincidence that the beatitude following peacemaking is, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake? One thing you can say about Jesus is that he never tried to sugarcoat the cost of discipleship. Of course, times changed. After the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and the church quickly accommodated itself to the ethic of state-sponsored violence. St. Augustine justified the use of torture and war against heretics. He also helped the church develop a series of criteria for recognizing what he called a just war. Although the intention was to set limits on violence, for the most part, rulers over the next 2,000 years up to the present have found these criteria supple enough to justify virtually every war, often with Christian armies on both sides of a war justifying their cause by invoking the very same criteria. And uh, sadly, that's the actual case with Ukraine and Russia today. Still, the memory of Christ's admonitions lived on though largely as a council of perfection observed by monks and certain saints like Francis of Assisi. And yet at various times in history, there were men and women, such as the Mennonites or Quakers, who managed to recall this forgotten gospel note. For the most part, such peacemakers absented themselves personally from the call to war, but they did not interfere with the larger machinery of death. But we are living now in a different era of war. And that also means perhaps a different era of peacemaking. Henry Nouwen spelled this out very directly. He wrote, on August 6th, 1945, the day on which the atom bomb was first used in war, 
peacekeeping mean, peacekeeping came to mean that it could not have what huh, what it could not have meant before the task of saving humanity from collective suicide on that day he said the blessing on peacemakers became the blessing for our century the bombing of hiroshima and the nuclear arms race that followed have made peacemaking the central task for christians making peace today means giving a future to humanity making it possible to continue our life together on this planet it was not until the 20th century that catholics to any serious extent identified themselves with the nonviolence of jesus until quite recently individuals who took this stand were scorned and trivialized if not regarded as virtual heretics among catholics the person who did more than anyone else to change this was the american dorothy day who died in 1980 with whom as karen mentioned i i was privileged to work for the last 5 years of her life the founder of the catholic worker she was truly a woman of the beatitudes who not only embodied these values but pointed out their social implications and their radical challenge to the present world the catholic worker began with a newspaper and a house of hospitality to practice the works of mercy feeding the hungry sheltering the homeless this was in the heart of the depression she didn't just practice charity she also thirsted for justice protesting the system and structures that gave rise to such poverty and need she herself embraced a life of voluntary poverty striving to uproot in herself the values that help foster inequality injustice and violence above all she pointed toward the possibility of a different world and she did this not just with words but by trying to live by those alternative values and thus to model a society based on solidarity and community rather than competition and greed she called her program a revolution of the heart a revolution that must begin in the present with each one of us but might then spread and inspire others to build a new society in the shell of the old for dorothy day the key text of the gospels was jesus's teaching in matthew 25 that the poor are jesus and whatever we do for them is done directly to him this teaching was the foundation of her life she didn't believe her actions as a catholic worker could single-handedly solve the problems of the depression but she believed that the solution to social and economic problems must begin on the spiritual level with the capacity to see others especially those who are poor and hungry as our brothers and sisters but for dorothy this teaching had a further implication if what we did to others is what we did to christ then that applied as well to killing our neighbors even those disguised as enemies Dorothy took seriously Jesus's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount with the recognition that this was a new teaching one that utterly defied the logic on which so much of social life is based whether in religious teaching or political practice or so-called human nature you have heard it said but i say to you for her this applied especially to the teaching of nonviolence the shocking radicalism of this teaching exemplified not only in Jesus's words but in his death on the cross were as perhaps the single most distinctive feature of his message a new commandment i give you that you love one another as i have loved you she couldn't separate her practice of the works of mercy from the works of peace we were told to feed the hungry while war caused starvation we were told to comfort the afflicted while war brought misery and ruin and whatever was done to the least of these whether kindness or violence was counted as done directly to him these two were his words we were called to we were called to recognize christ in the disguise of our neighbors and he came disguised as a crucified jew and this was a scandal he came disguised in the body of the poor and this was a stumbling block it was harder still to see him behind the face of the one called enemy this was true folly in the world in the eyes of the world but we were not told to love up to the point of reason prudence or personal safety but to love unreasonably foolishly under the cross of course if you tell people that you have come to replace logic and realism with foolishness that's usually not a very winning message but i think her point was that jesus was proposing a different kind of logic different kind of realism so people have asked me what would dorothy say about the present situation in the world and i can only think of how she actually responded to the situation she confronted 
which was one of the most terrible situations in modern history. So what did she do when the U.S. was attacked at Pearl Harbor? In the January 1942 issue, she published a front page editorial that began, Dear fellow workers in Christ, Lord God, merciful God, our Father, shall we keep silent or shall we speak? And if we speak, what shall we say? She continued, we will print the words of Christ who is with us always, even to the end of the world. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who persecute and calumniate you so that you may be children of your father in heaven who makes his son to rise on the good and the evil and sends rain on the just and the unjust. We are still pacifists. Our manifesto is the Sermon on the Mount, which means that we will try to be peacemakers. She realized that this war was a terrible case. She understood what Nazism meant. But even in such a case, in her view, it did not supersede the gospel commandment of love. Not all her associates agreed, and it nearly split the movement. But for Dorothy, she made no attempt to impede the war effort. But in the midst of a dark time, she maintained the conviction that if humans were to survive, there would have to be some few who affirmed the efficacy of a power greater than death and held out tenaciously for the sanctity of life. This was arguably naive and impractical in the face of such evil as Hitler. But for Dorothy, it was important to recognize the divergent paths between the logic of the Beatitudes and the logic of war, even for a just cause. And here's where Dorothy Day's supposed unrealism and foolishness comes into a different kind of relief. Because as the war progressed, and as she foresaw, the effort to expunge the evil of Nazism by means of superior force would unleash on the world possibilities more terrible than anything known before. By the war's end, hundreds of thousands of people had been burned alive in Hamburg, Dresden, and Tokyo, not in ovens, but in their homes and cellars. The further destruction of two cities in Japan by atomic bombs would open the window on a new world in which such weapons, in effect, portable death camps, each with the destructive capacity of an Auschwitz, would be routinely manufactured by assembly line. This was not done by Hitler. This was done by those who considered themselves the defenders of all that was right and true. And it's a sign of the terrible danger posed not just by evil tyrants, but by the logic of justified violence, violence in the pursuit of a just or noble cause. The chosen strategy for defeating Germany and Japan affected a moral transformation in the victorious nations, a kind of mutation in the moral DNA of civilization. Somewhere a line was crossed so that afterward, it would no longer seem barbarous or an unimaginable crime to set cities on fire or later to contemplate obliterating whole countries in the name of defense or national security. Perhaps it was only the inevitable outcome of an evolutionary process that began when Christians chose to transform the Beatitudes into metaphorical cheese. Dorothy considered the situation in the light of the gospel. In the face of weapons of indiscriminate destruction, the teaching of indiscriminate love had, she believed, become a practical necessity, an imperative. To live under the protection of such weapons without resisting, without raising an outcry was in her view to participate in the ultimate blasphemy. And so in the 1950s, she moved beyond simply repeating the words in the Sermon on the Mount to engage in active resistance. For many years running, she and her companions were arrested and jailed for refusing to comply with compulsory civil defense drills in New York City, exercises that she regarded as rehearsals for doomsday. Very few people agreed with her. She was considered irrational and impractical. Meanwhile, policies that could result in massive death beyond any capacity for comprehension were considered prudent, rational, logical. During the later years of these protests, my father was serving as a government defense analyst who specialized in nuclear war plans. He saw the plan for general nuclear war that could be triggered by any engagement between American and Soviet troops anywhere in the world. It involved launching nuclear missiles at every city in Russia and China with a population over 100,000. The estimated death toll from such a war, they actually had it written down, not counting casualties on our own side or fallout 
affecting our allies in Japan, India, Europe, was 600 million. In shock, my father felt then and still does that no project in human history has more deserved to be recognized as evil and insane. So who is crazy? Who is irrational? Among those who believe that Dorothy Day was not the crazy one was the Trappist monk Thomas Merton. At that time, he was the, the best known spiritual writer in the world. Since becoming a Trappist monk in 1942, Merton had gradually been moving toward the conviction that he must apply the logic of the Gospels to a world in the grip of self-destructive compulsions and ideologies. He began publishing some of his writings in The Catholic Worker. He believed that the kind of thinking reflected in our nuclear planning was literally insane. The idea that you could defend democracy by killing hundreds of millions of people, that you could conceive of doing this in the defense of Christ or spiritual values was the greatest form of blasphemy. He wrote a book called Peace in the Post-Christian Era. He was referring to the situation of a society that formally makes loud appeals to Christian values while pursuing policies that are utterly contrary to the spirit of Christ. Whether we like it or not, he wrote, we have to admit that we are already living in a post-Christian world. That is to say, a world in which Christian ideals and attitudes are relegated more and more to the minority. It is frightening to realize that the facade of Christianity, which still generally survives, has perhaps little or nothing behind it, and that what was once called Christian society is more purely and simply a materialistic neo-paganism with a Christian veneer. Christianity, in a word, is everywhere yielding to the hegemony of naked power. Merton did not share Dorothy Day's absolute pacifism, but he shared her belief that in this nuclear age, we must find a different way. It was the way in which she staked her whole life, the different way of Jesus, the way of the Beatitudes. It might not be considered practical, but nothing about the Gospels promised that it would be practical or successful by any worldly measure. It was only in the 20th century with the experiments of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and many other examples in Iran, the Philippines, South Africa, Poland, Berlin, the Warsaw Pact, even the dissolution of the Soviet empire itself, that we saw evidence that the way of nonviolence was not simply a moral path, but that it had its own practical rationality. The great philosopher, and proponent of alternative economics, E.F. Schumacher, spoke of what he called a great convergence the convergence between the timeless wisdom of our greatest spiritual teachers and the practical survival of the human species. What has been considered practical, effective, and rational has been shown to mass kind of mass delusion. This is evident not only in our preparations for nuclear war, but in our calculated passivity in the face of climate change. Even when it has been demonstrated scientifically that our economic systems and culture are planting seeds of our own destruction, we insist it's not economically or politically possible to do otherwise. Instead, we seem to move aggressively in the opposite direction. As much in the, as in the time of Dorothy Day, or the time of Jesus for that matter, we face a crossroad, a fork leading in different directions toward a world of peace, mercy, solidarity, care for creation, or we continue on the path of greatness, power, domination of the weak and the earth. How do we relate this to the present situation in Ukraine? No doubt this is a difficult question. Of course, we pray for the suffering people of Ukraine, all victims of war and oppression. Of course, we can distinguish between the violence of aggressive invaders and the violence of those defending their own home. That distinction matters, though it will matter very little if the tripwire of nuclear war is crossed. Yet I fear that even in the best of outcomes for this war, the final victor will be war itself. That will be so unless we look into this crisis to find an off-ramp from the endless logic of violence. That off-ramp will not be found by simply identifying Russia or Vladimir Putin as the new focus of evil in the world, replacing those uh, the position previously occupied by Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein. As the world unites in standing up to aggression, it's considered in poor taste to remember the 20 year war in Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, the routinized practice of drone warfare, the genocidal US funded war in Yemen, or the forgotten history of napalm, white phosphorus and carpet bombing of Indochina. The arms re industry rejoices in this war, 
Not only can we expect that the possibility of nuclear arms reduction will be taken off the table, but we now face an investment of trillions of dollars in new world-destroying weapons. Meanwhile, while we focus on Ukraine, we forget the ongoing continuation around the world of what Pope Francis has called a piecemeal World War III. In this situation, what is the calling of a peacemaker? A peacemaker is not someone who has an easy answer for every social conflict, or is it someone who simply tries to avoid conflict or proposes passivity in the face of injustice or aggression? Peacemaking is not just a matter of opposing war. In a world that lives and breathes the logic of justified violence, the peacemaker is someone with imagination, someone faced with two options who sees and chooses the third, someone when faced with the message that this is the way it has always been done, is able to say, the way it's always been done does not work. There has to be a different way. The peacemaker is someone who dreams and envisions something different, and in that imagination makes it possible. The peacemaker is the child who says, the emperor has no clothes. The system we've engineered to protect us is the greatest threat to our survival, and thus makes it possible for others to see and acknowledge it as well. In the case of Ukraine, we need peacemakers who can hold in place two truths. Yes, that the Ukrainian people have a just cause, and that yes, we have to find a way out of this war, which only promises endless suffering and the pending threat of catastrophe. Dorothy Day believed that to be a Christian was to respond every day to the challenge of peacemaking. She believed we had to translate the way of peace into a consistent way of life. It should be reflected in in how we work and support ourselves, how we raise our children, how we relate to the needs of those around us, finding occasions in every situation to raise our voices for peace. To be a peacemaker was to be one of those who point in the direction of a different way, a different a way of living that promotes the just flourishing of creation, including human beings and other creatures, and in that sense, we can see that the call to be a peacemaker is not just some separate category, often its own, separate from the entire spiritual attitude and vision in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Doesn't this call us to relinquish the habit of identifying ourselves with what we own and consume, with all that allows us to differentiate ourselves from others instead of emphasizing the common bonds of humanity? Blessed are the meek. It means learning the power that lies in small things, what is apparently insignificant. It means learning to listen to the quiet, delicate equilibrium of the earth itself. It's the gentle, nonviolent power that's hidden in apparent weakness, a power that is absurdity in the context of the glory that is Rome or a Make America Great rally. Blessed are those who mourn. What is so blessed about mourning? I don't think it has to do with being sad all the time. It means keeping our hearts open to the suffering of others, whether the cry of the poor or the cry of the earth, exchanging our hearts of stone for a heart of flesh. It was two years ago that people all over the world were shaken out of the slumber of indifference by the death of George Floyd. Black Lives Matter is a cry of affirmation, a cry for life, but it is rooted in an experience of pathos. It is an expression of mourning that arises from a situation in which black lives do not matter. What does it take for us to believe that future generations matter, that the earth matters? Without a capacity to mourn, how are we to address the plight of refugees dying in the desert or drowning at sea or the fate of victims of war and violence in Ukraine and around the world? In this time of climate change, how are we to address the crisis if we're not able to mourn the demise of a glacier, a rainforest, a coral reef, another few hundred species. We could go through all these beatitudes and see how they are all actually culminating and encompassed in peacemaking. They are all part of a spirituality of peacemaking that certainly includes protesting war or military spending, but goes farther. They're part of a comprehensive way of life that uproots the logic of violence, the division of the world into us and them, friends and enemies, not just turning away from war, but from the cult of power, the thirst for success, the celebration of greatness, the pursuit of victory that merely plants the seeds of a greater defeat. Spiritual poverty, 
meekness, mercy, purity of heart, the capacity to mourn, to thirst for justice, one or another might take priority in a particular context. But altogether, they're things that make for peace. So the great English peacemaker Muriel Lester wrote, the job of the peacemaker is to stop war, to purify the world, to get it saved from poverty and riches, to heal the sick, to comfort the sad, to wake up those who have not yet found God, to create joy and beauty wherever you go, to find God in everything and in everyone. In other words, peacemaking is an expression of spirituality, but it is also a spirit, a spirit that issues a no to everything that degrades life. Violence, yes, but also white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, disregard for the earth and its creatures. But at the same time, is it a spirit that issues a yes to goodness, generosity, care, and kindness, everything that affirms life? Are we living in a post-Christian era? Or is it really a pre-Christian era? Chesterton said, Chesterton, uh, Christianity has not been tried and failed. It has been found difficult and so not tried. It's up to us those who call ourselves Christian, to make the words and vision of Christ visible and credible in the world we live in. Woe to us if history records that we found this difficult and so did not try. As the theologian Dorothy Sole wrote, sin has to do not just with what we do, but with what we allow to happen. Blessed are the peacemakers. This and all the Beatitudes are the signature, the identity card of the Christian but they are also a call, an invitation to join Jesus on the path of discipleship. They are calling us to a new way, a way that doesn't just flow against the tide of the world, but also flows toward a different world, a world animated by different values, different priorities, different dreams. And as with any great journey, we create that path by walking it. Thank you very much. Robert, Robert, thank you for helping us probe the vision of peacemaking to which Jesus and the Beatitudes calls us, and for your honesty about your own questions and anxieties, and for the rich insights you offered. You've grounded the spirituality of peacemaking in the scriptures, in the lived experience and wisdom of the early church, and in the witness of Christians who have been advocating for peace since Hiroshima. We need that grounding if we are to be both people of prayer and advocates for peace now. And I love how you put it, to live into the Beatitudes is to act in hope, to translate the way of peace into a consistent way of life, not just pointing out the path, but by prayerfully creating that path by walking it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have assembled a panel of four speakers this evening to respond to Robert, not respond in the sense of argue with him, but rather to provide us with insights on peacemaking from their unique perspectives. An Archbishop of Ukrainian heritage, a First Nations woman who works in conflict resolution, a Mennonite who daily is addressing injustice, and an artist and educator whose faith and career has been a testament to the joy and hope the arts can contribute to our common life. We're going to start with Archbishop Boris Gudziak. Boris Gudziak is Metropolitan Archbishop of Philadelphia of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. His parents immigrated to the USA in the 1950s. In addition to earning degrees in Syracuse, Rome, and Harvard, he lived and taught for many years in the Ukraine founding the Lviv Institute in Church History and teaching at the Lviv Theological Academy and Ukrainian Catholic University. Archbishop Gudziak has offered commentary on political, cultural, and religious affairs and authored academic and popular books and articles. Many of you may have heard his interview with Karen Pascal for the Now and Then podcast series. Archbishop Gudziak joins us this evening from Europe if nothing else, this should signal for you the depth of his commitment to speaking with us on peace, because it's 2 a.m. in Europe. Archbishop Kudziak, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Karen, for your invitation. Um, 
I, I thank the Henry Mellon Society for this opportunity. And it's uh, maybe interesting for, no, for you to know that I'm speaking from a Nauen household in, in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a guest of Laurent, Laurent Nauen. Uh, and um, we've been spending the, 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 the previous evening speaking about Henry and, and uh, mentioning uh, you and uh, many who you, whom you know. Um, I'm on my way to Ukraine, uh, where I'll be uh, for a few days, uh, probably just in the eastern part, but also visiting many of the refugees uh, that uh, are, I visited refugees, saw refugees in Paris yesterday. I'll be seeing some in the Netherlands uh, tomorrow morning, and then I'll be in Poland uh, on Wednesday. I come to you maybe more with questions than with, with uh, proposals. Uh, from a distance, uh, I share... Uh, some of the experiences that uh, formed Robert uh, were approximately the same age. Uh, we were Henry's students. Uh, I read uh, with great interest uh, and fascination uh, books about um, Dorothy Day and her writings. Also, my Thomas Merton was a writer that uh, influenced me greatly as my vocation was developing. I'm also formed by the experience of my parents who were refugees of World War II, who fled uh, both uh, Soviet and Nazi um, violence uh, of that war. My parents were born in 1926. They were 13 when the war began and they were uh, basically 23, 24, when they finally landed in the United States. So it was kind of a decade of, of um, war and refugee uh, experience uh, in informative years of their life. I have a 93-year-old aunt, the last descendant, last person of that generation. Uh, she's my godmother, and um, her mind is now weak. She doesn't remember well, but every time I see her, she speaks of the horrors of the war. That is something that is deeply etched into her psyche and soul. Um, there are so many people in the world uh, who are scarred um, for, the, for a lifetime by, by violence and war. Um, when I served uh, as bishop in Paris, I had a colleague uh, who was the Ukrainian Catholic bishop in London. His name is Hlib, and my name is Boris. Those of you that know something about Ukrainian Christianity and Slavic church history might remember that the first saints of Kiev and Rus are Boris and Hlib, or sometimes... Uh, pronounced Boris and Gleb. Uh, they were the sons of St. Volodymyr the Great, who in 988 accepted Christianity for Kiev and Rus. And 900 years before Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, before Dorothy Day, they made a radical stand of nonviolence. Uh, when their father died in 1015, a thousand and six years ago, uh, as had been the pattern in many uh, dynastic situations, there was a struggle for the mastery of the central throne of, of the realm. In this uh, time of internecine um, violence, these two brothers, according to the saints' lives that is preserved uh, for us, refused to raise their sword against their brother, Sviatopolk, uh, and 
they said, in, in, in the absence of our father, Buludimir, you will be our father. And yet, uh, out of fear for uh, possible uh, competition, uh, which is something that I think uh, Robert very um, astutely pointed to, in light of this uh, fear of competition from the brothers, uh, Seattle Polk uh, had them both killed. And even before Vladimir, even before Olga, his grandmother, the first of the royal line to accept Christianity, the two brothers were the first canonized saints. Uh, Bishop Hlib and I, Hlib and Boris, Boris and Hlib, created uh, a brotherhood of Saints Boris and Hlib, a uh, brotherhood for men. Um, I think uh, the male side of the human race is enduring a, a type, time of challenge and, and there's great crisis. And this is a brotherhood of, of prayer, of, uh, of courage and of peace. When I describe this, uh, I must admit that this brotherhood has not ac- exactly taken off. Uh, there's a, a small membership and many of us, including myself, are not maybe uh, too too loyal uh, to the few disciplines that uh, we have proposed for each other. I share all this with you uh, because there's great affinity with uh, for for both for me for Robert's pedigree and for what he said. And yet there are so many questions. I look at Ukraine today. Uh, this is uh, largely ignored in, in uh, discussions of Ukraine, even in uh, discussions of um, uh, peace and just war or non-just war peacemaking. In 1991, Ukraine had, I think, 960,000 soldiers. Over uh, the subsequent uh, decades, by by 214, when it was invaded by Russia, it was down to about 150,000 troops, so a reduction of 800,000, uh, of which only 10,000 were battle ready. Uh, the army was so depleted that uh, when uh, the so-called green men, uh, the Russian soldiers who did not wear insignia came into Crimea, there was nobody uh, to, to resist uh, their acts of annexation. More importantly, Ukraine became the first state in human history to unilaterally uh, and completely uh, take apart its nuclear arsenal. Ukraine had more nukes than England, France, and China put together. And in 1994, um, under great pressure, it should be admitted from from many countries, it got rid of its nuclear arsenal. It received, according to the Budapest Memorandum, guarantees of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, Now, um, you know, Almost, almost 30 years later, uh, the country is suffering a devastating invasion and uh, a war that is killing probably 500 people per day, causing uh, billions of dollars of infrastructure and economic damage, a war that has pushed 12 million people from their homes. And we, you know, are inspired and awed by the generosity of the Poles who received 3 million people of Hungary, Slovakia, uh, Moldova together that have received a million and other countries, uh, all of the countries that I'm visiting now who are uh, dotted uh, with, with refugees. Uh, you go into a metro in France and you can hear them, the, the Ukrainian uh, or Russian speaking uh, Ukrainian citizens who have just arrived. Uh, 
But there are 7 million refugees or 7 million internally displaced people in Ukraine. Ukrainians have received 7 million people. And besides that, there's 12 million people who are still at home but cannot survive without humanitarian aid. So it's approximately 25 million people that are, are completely dependent. Uh, the economy has been uh, broken uh, profoundly. Uh, 50 to 60% of it is, is dormant. Um, the effects of the, the war will, will be broad. Uh, estimates range from 550 to 300 million people will uh, have less food or will suffer famine in the coming year because of uh, the displacement of regular ag agricultural production. This war is devastating. Um, and I'm very much challenged uh, by uh, the position of Dorothy Day, uh, who is centered at, uh, who is at the center of Robert's talk. I feel if I go into a subway and I see that um, uh, you know, elderly women is being attacked by somebody, I will try to pull that man off. Uh, I will try to defend that person, even if it means using physical force. Um, I think the world has been riveted to the situation in Ukraine because there are profound truths of Jesus uh, that are being manifested. There's a certain hope in fearlessness. Uh, people are human, people uh, have flesh and blood, and blood is being shed, and it would be uh, you know, fantastic to say people are not afraid. But people do not panic. When I call Ukraine a few times a day, whether it's bishops or students or family members or friends, uh, I always come back, come away um, encouraged uh, by their resolve. People are willing to die for their friends. That is the greatest love, Jesus says in John 15, 13. And I think that in searching for peace, we really have to go very deep. Um, if we want systems of peace, I think we need systems of justice and righteousness. It's too late to talk, you know, about uh, some principles uh, when uh, somebody is being raped or when there's uh, um, an attack like Ukraine uh, is enduring, uh, completely, completely unprovoked. A Ukraine that made itself vulnerable by reducing its army from 960,000 to 10,000 battle-ready troops. Can you imagine? I mean, just think of, think of that step of, 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 of a nonviolent attitude in the political system in, in, in the society at large. A country that gave up its nuclear weapons and received guarantees from the United States, from Russia and Great Britain of its territorial integrity. I fear that uh, as long as we live, we will, um, we will see violence because violence comes from that first grab of Adam. God the giver gives. He gave everything to Adam and Eve that they needed. And yet he said, take not of this, uh, the fruit of this tree because you will die. And Adam becomes the first grabber. The, the weakness, the sin of human nature is that grab, the appropriation of the other. Uh, taking others' lives, taking other people's livelihoods. Uh, Russia is 28 times as big as Ukraine. 
but it needs the 29th part. 11 time zones is not enough. Um, it is profoundly sad and scandalizing that the Russian Orthodox Church today uh, justifies uh, this, this grab. Not a single bishop of the 300 Russian Orthodox bishops has, stepped, uh, has spoken out against this war. And out of the 25,000 priests and deacons, only 293 have signed a petition uh, condemning this war. 700 university presidents have, um, have signed uh, a, a, a declaration supporting President Putin. And of course, sociological surveys in a society that is moving from authoritarianism to totalitarianism are not fully reliable, but the ones that exist show that uh, Putin supposedly is supported by 80% of the population and 70% support this invasion of Ukraine. The need for peacemaking uh, is undeniable for a Christian. It's an imperative. How to go about it? how to speak about it in this war is a great quandary. Uh, Pope Francis is bewildered. He's saying things that uh, Ukrainians are finding, uh, frankly speaking, unpalatable. Um, it is a long tradition of Vatican diplomacy not to name aggressors. Yet is that really making peace? Is, that, is, is it being a priest to say, I will go to Russia to uh, speak with um, Putin, maybe somehow to avert uh, further warfare, but I will not go now to Ukraine because it won't, it won't have an effect. I think we priests are called to go to a patient who is hopelessly dying. Uh, I have no doubt that Pope Francis uh, is a prophetic personality, and he his his, his thought and uh, word, and especially his deed, is is a, a guideline for for me in in my humble ministry. But I find that in the face of uh, contemporary violence, modern warfare. In a nuclear age, uh, there are a great many questions. I don't think we'll answer them unless we uh, really confront human sinfulness, not only in the area of violence, but in general. Um, I find it very difficult to understand how great peacemakers can support uh, radical abortion policy. I find it difficult for us to talk about peacemaking without really understanding the profundity of human sin and the weakness of human nature. Archbishop, I look for guidance and I will um, be caring for probably many days and months uh, uh, Robert's words today. Uh, that I read carefully and listened to. Um, but I find uh, um, a radical pacifism as a Ukrainian, as somebody who has friends uh, and associates killed, injured uh, in refugee status, I find... Um, the kind of pacifism that Dorothy Day uh, espouses something that I cannot accept. Um, I wish I could, but today I um, believe Ukrainians have to defend themselves. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I do, I do join you. Bishop uh, Gutiak, um, yeah. we're going to have to wrap up. We have three other folks. Sure. I, I, I would join you at this time during the middle of a, 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 a trip that's uh, 14 cities in 14 days. 
because I find uh, what what we are discussing to be so important. Um, and thank you, thank you so much again for this time of the day in the Netherlands and for your commitment to speak with us and for um, for really underscoring the difficulties that we face in trying to achieve peace. Thank you so much. Joanne Jefferson lives on the West Coast and is a member of Stolo Nation. She is Quiquelsum Wellness Manager for the Stolo Health Services. Her work in wellness encompasses justice, mental health, and addictions. Joanne has worked for her nation for 21 years. She is also co-chair co for Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle. Joanne is involved in the work of justice and restoring relationships. It is boots on the ground work and she is deeply committed to that work in her local community. It is not peace work done on the world stage, but rather the patient, deep work of the heart. In truth, it is the foundation of all peace work. Welcome, Joanne. Kwasai, Kwasai, my hands go up to each and every one of you that have decided to come and spend time. I'd just like each of you to put your hands on your heart and just take a deep breath in and slowly release it. Just take another deep breath in and slowly release it. The conversations we need to have as humans, as people that are God's children, as creator's children, often go straight there. They go right to our heart. And sometimes words get in the way of how to, to be the first day you were born, with purity and love, humility. Some of the sacred teachings that we have as homo people, as First Nations people, um, require action of oneself. The work on yourself will reflect in the way that you treat others. Words like courage. What did you do today that was courageous? Just like the elder had shared before, I witnessed somebody getting hurt, I stepped in. I use my words to stop oppression, racism. Honesty. Looking within your heart and saying, am I being honest and true to myself as how I'm reflecting how to be? And that's hard work. It's hard to look at yourself and know you're doing what is right from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep. Lay your head on your pillow and know that you've done the absolute best that you could from that place. Wisdom, each of you talked about the Bible. We talk about our ancestors, our elders, and we reflect on their wisdom and their knowledge. And we don't, we, we make things com complicated as our elders would say. Keep it simple. Find ways to keep it simple, to engage one another without this conflict within. Our people have come from so much oppression and so much hardships. Finding that peace, Lequi Shuali, peaceful spirit. That's what my spirit is. It's taken a long time for me to find that and to honor 
the wisdom of our elders, the wisdom of our ancestors, the wisdom of the words that were written for your, for your knowledge to kind of follow along and, and know that people ahead of us and behind us actually use those to support how they are with one another. It's not a hard concept, but we definitely sure make it complicated. Humility, truth, respect, love, all of the things that one another, each and every one of us can thread together and find ways to look within, within ourselves. How are we going to act? How are we, how are we going to put in motions these sacred laws? Sacred because if I interrupt them, it interrupts the way we live. It breaks the harmony, like what Quickelstone means. Living in harmony, bringing people to a better place. And my behavior, if it changes and is bad, as there's no word for that in our language, um, then we have to identify the behavior, not the person as the bad person. One of our elders that has passed on said, we're all good people. We all come here with a pure heart. But often we have to revert to protecting it. And how we protect it is up to us. But at the same time, is that uh, like a pebble in the water, just, you know, the waves making it harder for others? Or are we gentle with ourselves? Can we find ways to find grace with ourselves so that when we interact with one another, it's, it's from that place? It's not head talk. It's heart talk. If you can move your mind from your heart to your heart. And sometimes that's a long journey. It's a long journey to get from your head to your heart because we're so trained to use our mind and we can get stuck there. And then we get in this cycle. When we have so many cycles, you know, violent cycles, abuse of cycles, you know, family dynamic cycles. I, I just want each and every one of you to walk away knowing that you can create peace by creating peace for yourself. Creating peace within yourself will support a movement like tonight. With Paul organizing this many people or all the organizers organizing these, you know, all these people from all over, different times coming together because we want to do something. We want to stop something. We want to encourage a movement that comes from that place. And that's the beauty of, of coming from Creator, Chicho Siam, as we call it, is that each and every one of us have those teachings, basic teachings. But sometimes we make everything so complicated. I want to encourage you, encourage you to look in your backyard and find ways that you can make peace with yourself and with your neighbor, with your community, with your nation. So that when we expand outside of Canada or America, that it comes from that holistic place. And I think about reconciliation 
And I know it's hard because we teach a lot of people about our historical impacts. It's not up to us to take the shame and the blame, but it is up to us to accept the education, to act in a better way, and to connect to one another in the way that the Creator wanted us to. We don't have the answers. Whoops, okay. I want to thank you again. Um, kwasai, kwasai, eight slat, as they say in our language, eight slat, have a good night. Joanne, thank you so much. And um, what you said in particular about um, humility, peace, and love, and weaving that together, I thought was just beautiful. Thank you so much. And you've brought us, um, you brought us a perspective that we don't hear very often, perhaps not at all. And deeply, deeply appreciated. Thank you. Our next speaker, Willard Metzger, earned a degree in sociology and two in theology. He's the author of Thanking God with Integrity, Table Graces and Scriptures for a World in Need. Willard was the executive director of the Mennonite Church in Canada before becoming the executive director of Citizens for Public Justice in 2019. CPJ's work focuses on justice in the areas of poverty, ecology, and immigration, three areas that relate directly to peace work. Willard and the organization he leads model a type of nonviolent resistance that focuses on education of faith communities, creative programming, and in Canada's capital, working to reshape public policy. Willard has been a member of the Voices for Peace organizing team since 2019. We're especially appreciative of his time with us this evening as CPJ launches their annual conference seeking justice in our institutions tomorrow. And you can see the sign behind where Willard is sitting. Willard, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, welcome. Well, thank you to the two uh, um, very rich responses and to Robert for your very fulsome presentation and to all of you for being here. Robert, I, I very much appreciate your emphasis on meekness in your presentation and its critical role in peacemaking. So I've been asked to respond to the presentation from the experience of the recent trucker protest occupation that was held in Ottawa this past winter. For three weeks, residents and businesses in downtown Ottawa were prevented from being able to freely access and enjoy their properties. Living myself within the red zone of the occupation has caused me to do some deep reflection on how we define peace, how we define violence, especially since this occupation was called a peaceful protest by those engaged in the action and those supporting it. So I would wonder if a presentation on peacemakers may also need some serious reflection on the violence that can be generated by meekness. While it is true, as residents of downtown Ottawa, not many were physically beaten, although there were incidents of physical and verbal assault, and not to mention the week-long attack of blaring horns. But for me, the most disconcerting element of the occupation was the weaponizing of meekness. I first witnessed it in my local grocery store when a young couple cheerfully refused to wear a face mask as they did their shopping. At the checkout, the young man had a broad smile stretched across his face as he cheerfully asked the fully masked checkout clerk, how is your day going? The clerk mumbled some response to which the young man retorted, oh, that good, eh? That exchange felt deeply violent. Now, 
maybe if the young couple didn't believe that there really was a pandemic, then they would not recognize the offensive disregard for these heroic essential workers who risk their welfare to make sure that we could all be fed. If you were to challenge the couple, they would most likely respond that all they were doing was being friendly, meekness in its sociable form. But then whenever I would venture along the 10 block stretch of one of the streets jammed with big rigs, I would be met with friendly protesters wishing me a good day. It was this friendliness that was the basis of defining the protest as peaceful. Yet for three weeks, they refused to leave. They wielded the nonviolent power of defiance. It would be like a family clan holding a massive reunion in front of your residence. Laughter and merrymaking fill the streets, but their partying prevents you from being able to get to your residence. In fact, every day you need to trudge through their reunion to get to your place. Eventually, after a week, you and all your neighbors ask if they could finish up their celebration so that the streets could be used again by residents. But instead of leaving, they erect a bouncy castle and place a hot tub onto the street. And during the weekends, thousands of others join the reunion and make it even more difficult for you to find enjoyment and peace in your residence. The revelers do not physically harm you. Instead, every day they smile and wave at you as you leave your place and wish you a good day. Robert, you define meekness in your presentation as the gentle, nonviolent power that is hidden in apparent weakness. I guess I am thinking there is a need to reflect deeply and interrogate the definition of nonviolent power. What are the necessary elements required to assure that power remains nonviolent? Because when a smile becomes a weapon, then meekness becomes violent. My experience was a three week protest, but it has left me altered and unglued. I am left to wonder how a continued presence of settlers or occupiers can ever be experienced as peaceful, particularly when the very act of remaining can be experienced as violent. Many of the participants in this event are from US and Canada, not all, but many, so to us, I guess I would say, unless we are able to truly recognize the systemic violence that's inherent in our colonialist history, I fear that our best attempts of embracing the cherished value of meekness will remain an ineffective attempt at making peace. Thank you. Well, Lord, thank you for that. That really gets at our need to discern what's going on below the surface, to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Next is Misha Brugger Gossman. Misha started singing in her Fredericton, New Brunswick church as a child began voice lessons at the age of seven, 
She graduated with a degree in music from the University of Toronto and pursued a master's degree in Germany. Her music career began with song recital, but gradually expanded to include opera, gospel, and jazz. I own several albums and have heard her live on numerous occasions. I can say she is equally at home in every genre. The documentary film Songs of Freedom explores her family's heritage from the west coast of Africa to slavery in the USA and eventual freedom in Canada. She recently released her memoir, Something is Always on Fire, and is currently artist in residence at Opera Atelier in Toronto. Misha is as passionate about her faith as she is about music. Misha, thank you so much for being with us tonight and welcome. It is so my honor to be here, Paul. I can't even tell you. I'm beyond excited. Oh, that last thing that riled me up by, like, I'm down here in Nova Scotia. I knew people at that rally, I'll just tell you. Like, it is hot up in here. Thank you so much for sharing that, Willard. That really helped me a lot. I really, there's so much we all don't know. And I think firsthand accounts only help us understand, you know, our perspective. But I think, ooh, and Holy Spirit, keep this internet connection stable. I think we always have to understand that it is a perspective and God knows everything. And so he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and all truth will be revealed and we are but holders of slicers, of a sliver of a side of all of humanity that he ordered. So we submit to like a grander perspective. That's all I was going to say. Um, but I really wanted to be grateful and express like my gratitude for being here. I hope, I pray like Holy Spirit enter in, keep the internet connection stable. Your world, your will be done, the words of, okay, I was just saying, I wanted to say, since I'm the last responder of the day, I thought it was important to pause for the cause and put some, like, respect on the almighty name of the holy of holies, amen, whom we all serve, by the way. Uh, Christ followers, oof, I'm going to use the stand here with, like, a few notes on it. Christ's followers are here to do the will of the Father, as perfectly and supremely exemplified in the life, death, and resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Anointed One, the Messiah, and the Roaring Lion of Judah, lest we forget. He is the one in control. We aren't here to convince or manipulate or get caught in the weeds of a world that Jesus already overcame by overcoming death, the ultimate result of like sin, which is separation from God. So if we believe in the resurrecting power of the Holy Spirit, then our rightful place is in heavenly places. Can I just talk real? Can I just really take it to a place because I think we're all here to understand that God is at work. So we are citizens of heaven and by faith, we have the mind of Christ Jesus himself. So when it comes to peacemaking, we are already in full possession of God's gifts of power, love, and a sound mind. We're just trying to strengthen the muscle, but we have it. Love, power, this how I, okay? I also think it's important, <laughs> just to be clear, like, I think it's important that I, like, I'm talking to those who profess Jesus Christ, like, as their Lord and Savior, and understand that apart from the power of God, we can do nothing. Like, those are the people, like, I want to be clear that that's who I'm talking to. Because, like, it is essential. It's like, it's an essential fundamental humility that will allow us to make and maintain anything remotely resembling peace. Whether it be peace inside ourselves or peace in the world at large. 
But like how? Like I'm taking a bit of time here, but I think I can log off. <laughs> I just want to make sure I make this point. I'm cutting my speech super short because I'm taking a long time, but how do we combat and confront the atrocities of this present darkness and press on towards the goal that is set in Christ Jesus? How? How? Like, Mr. Ellsberg, like, that was a beautiful, incredible, like, insightful, God-filled, really examination of, you know, what, like, a beautiful keynote address. I want to add that Absolutely nothing we try to accomplish in this earthly realm can be done without prayer. Prayer, people. Like, can we just pause for the cause? Prayer. Like, let me say, perhaps it's taken for granted that we all have an active prayer life, but I don't think it can be overstated that an ongoing dialogue with God comprised of more listening than speaking is the only strategy that can really affect any kind of transformative change in our hearts and in our world. Complacency surrounding the power and effectiveness of prayer is like everywhere. We really don't understand its power. We don't lean into it. We don't spend time with it. It's too, too, it's like, <clears throat> it's inconvenient. It takes time, right? But it's the only thing as a church, like, we need to be reminded that we've already won. And prayer is the only practice that allows us to share in that victory fully. Like, in the here and now, you transcend into the heavenly realm where there are angels praising God eternally. You get to live that in prayer. Like, if you're not spending time with God, you're not understanding the power that we have. So I think it's essential any talk. Like just be bathed in the spirit field. Don't do it without him. How dare you? You know, so okay. The last thing I'm gonna say. <laughs> I've got like pages here, but I, okay. The last thing I'm gonna say. We simply cannot forget the sovereignty of God. Like, we can't forget. I wanted to tell you this thing that I thought was... Are you, Paul, are you making me wrap up? Misha. Um, yes, Misha, we need to move. We've got folks who have submitted okay. a lot of questions, and we're going to have to try and get to some of the questions. Ooh, okay. So, the last thing I'm going to say is that I am great, grateful, supremely grateful, for a platform like yours, Paul, thank you, that mandates the exploration of the deeply important world-changing and soul-challenging practices of Jesus Christ that are essential to the strategy of peacemaking. Amen. Misha, thank you. And I appreciate especially the emphasis on the emphasis on prayer and on love. And I think um, we've seen tonight in Robert's presentation and in the res four responses that um, there's a variety of perspectives and a variety of insights. Uh, there's no one way to be a peacemaker. As I mentioned, um, we asked when you registered if you had questions uh, that you wished our speakers to address and we received over 150. I'm pretty certain we won't be able to cover them all this evening but I've sifted through them over the last few days and grouped them into three broad categories. There are a number on Ukraine and Russia. There are a number that I would say focus on spirituality or heart work. And a number, probably the majority, that are asking about practical action. So I'm gonna begin by directing some of those questions to Robert Ellsberg and our panel. And we'll be watching the chat to see if there's questions outside these categories that arise. Robert, I want to go back to you to begin with, um, particularly with, with your knowledge of, of Dorothy and Merton's uh, opposition to, to uh, nuclear war. Um, 
One of the questions that came in said, I'm so frustrated with U.S. hypocrisy about nuclear disarmament. We condemn others for accumulating weapons while maintaining the world's largest arsenal. And the question is, can peace ever come without de de-escalation and disarmament? Um, I, I, uh, I, I really want to be able to uh, speak to, uh, to uh, Boris and to thank him very much for uh, the beautiful uh, presentation he made on, on behalf of the people of Ukraine and, and their history and, the, and his uh, very gentle challenge to me uh, about the real complexity of, of this uh, situation. And when I said in the beginning that I felt anxious about this, uh, this topic, uh, it was not just because I didn't have you know, answers, I thought, to a lot of the questions people might have, but specifically because uh, the, this case uh, challenges me very uh, deeply uh, for some of the same reasons that, that, that you mentioned. And the, uh, the concern that, you know, that I have uh, followed in my life, I've tried, you know, in the spirit of Dorothy Day, who is my, my spiritual teacher and guide, uh, and to say, you know, regretfully that in many ways, I, I don't know how to respond from that perspective to uh, a situation such as you're describing. And I acknowledge very much, uh, you know, what you say about uh, perhaps making a fetish out of one aspect of peacemaking uh, that doesn't uh, address the other aspects that include uh security that include uh justice uh and and these other things that make for peace uh and i think that was one of the reasons that thomas merton didn't choose to call himself a pacifist although he felt that in the nuclear age uh it was very hard to uh, imagine any kind of, of legitimate uh, war given that kind of danger uh but i think it's because he felt that it could yeah. In a way, make an idol out of out of 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 a deeply evangelical principle, uh, but that uh, could also be a kind of simplification uh, in a world, as you say, that is uh, very profoundly marked by by uh, by by sin and evil and, and and injustice in very deep ways that that we can't just focus on not having war without also uh, addressing those. So I just wanted to reach out and thank you very much for uh, the the challenge that you raised. I don't want to take too much time because uh, other people have to speak, but uh, yes, I what what can I say? I I think that that the, one of the most perilous things about this uh, situation in Ukraine uh, is the you know the mobilization. Uh, between uh, nuclear forces on on either side, with Ukraine uh, in the middle, Ukraine, which uh, very admirably, uh, heroically, as you said, uh, voluntarily disarmed itself of its nuclear arsenal. Um, the what I see, you know, unfortunately, is that many I think of those who are standing with Ukraine are not doing so in a spirit of peacemaking and would be very happy for this war to continue at, at some low grade uh, level and indefinitely uh, that it serves other geopolitical uh, interests and especially the justification of massive investment now uh, in a new generation of nuclear weapons and uh, preparation for doomsday. I don't see an off ramp for that. Uh, one may, maybe there was an opportunity uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, we didn't choose to 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 pursue that, uh, and now uh, this will be uh, this will be an occasion, an opportunity, an excuse uh, for uh, turning our backs completely on the threat of climate change, turning our backs completely on the possibility of of nuclear disarmament. So I feel that in the righteousness of support for uh, uh, the cause of Ukraine and its defense against aggression. Uh, we have to be also uh, raising very deep questions about the world that this is leading us to and whether it's not uh, planting the seeds of, of, of greater and more ca catastrophic violence. Thank you, Robert. Um, Archbishop 
Kudziak, we've had several questions along the lines of, other than prayers, how else may I help Ukraine with my meager finances? Uh, how would you suggest that individuals can advocate for an end to the Ukraine conflict? Well, uh, you know, I would join Misha in saying that uh, uh, prayer is, is really uh, very important. The Soviet Union fell apart uh, despite being uh, an empire armed to its teeth with nuclear weapons, not because of a war, uh, but I think it was a complex, you know, analysts are still arguing about it. But I think, uh, for example, Pope uh, John Paul II's um, moral position, uh, what Solidarity was doing in Poland and many other moral movements uh, that were rooted in prayer uh, contributed uh, to that, uh, to the demise of that empire of violence. Um, so prayer is indeed uh, very important. The second thing is it's very important to be informed. Um, there's, there's a lot of disinformation. There are a lot of illusions. Um, there's, you know, we, we still can say, kind of talk about holy Russia. Nobody would say like holy Holland or, you know, uh, great France, but we can say great Russia. There's a lot of deconstruction of um, the myths of imperialism and uh, colonialism that need to happen uh, regarding Russia, which have uh, progressed uh, on other fronts. I mean, it's inconceivable today for uh, most Christian churches Although, you know, Robert points out, you know, MAGA movements and other things like that. Most churches today are, are repenting, reconsidering their role in colonialism and slavery, etc. And today, unfortunately, the Russian Orthodox Church is unabashedly, unashamedly uh, promoting this war. So information is important to really understand things. Uh, and third is, um, you know, all of us have uh, limited conditional capacity to help. Uh, the question says meager means. Uh, everything that Jesus did was quite meager. I mean, he didn't have numbers. He didn't, he didn't have uh, a mass movement. Uh, the whole dynamic of our faith uh, as modeled by Jesus is one of witnessing. You witness whether you win or lose, uh, but you witness. Uh, the, the, word, the word for uh, witness in Greek or Latin is martyr. So martyrdom is, is willing to be willing to give. And if we can give what we can give, that is the best uh, that we can do. Uh, if we feed only 10 mouths out of those 24 million, uh, we've made a contribution. Right now, practically speaking, cash is best. Uh, not sending things uh, that, that's complicated. Uh, things that are sent have to be packaged, have to be sorted. Uh, it's best to contribute to organizations on the ground and give them the freedom uh, to buy and give uh, what is most necessary in a timely manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, you have not met Sister Mary Ellen Francoeur yet, but you're going to meet her now. Um, Sister Mary Ellen offered workshops at our first Voices for Peace on contemplative practice and how to disarm your heart and have the have enough gas in your tank to be an activist. Um, Sister Mary Ellen, we've got questions along those lines. And I, the question, uh, written question is, what practices do you use to bring peace into your own mind and being? And uh, what, uh, what practices can we adopt or promote? Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks to all the speakers uh, for each one's deep wisdom. 
a deep insight. I think that each one of the responders has actually spoken to that. Um, as far as myself, I think it would be things that reflect, as I say, already what has been shared. This is a Christian gathering for the most part. And so we've talked about God's mind, the perspective of God, um, the spirit, um, the God who lives in each person and in everything, in everything in the whole of creation. Um, so my contemplative practice is to really grow in that. I, 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 it's, it's spend a lifetime with that, but to really sit in an openness to recognize God living in everything, in every moment. Um, and what does that mean? How does that affect everything I do? Um, to sit with the words of Jesus and uh, Robert just so well names some of those very uh, pertinent words of Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. To really sit with that, to enter the heart and the mind of Jesus who reflected the mind of God, the vision of God. To see in the world, to see in all of creation, the beauty and wisdom and vision of God. Um, and, and as Joanne shared, the wisdom of Indigenous elders who have come out of their wisdom have shared with us those laws of respect, of love, of truth, of, of humility, um, to really bring those to every moment of my life, every movement in my life, every interaction. So I would leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Robert, I'm going to go back to you. Um, we have a question that's, what are the best ways to educate and motivate citizens for peace? And I think as uh, with in terms of your work with Dorothy and also your work as an educator, perhaps you could speak to that. Well, I said that that uh, we all had to try to find uh, a way in our own context or situation to raise our voices for peace. I found my way uh, on the path of being a, a publisher uh, dedicated to uh, promoting uh, peace uh, and have had the opportunity to publish uh, books by many of the great uh, peacemakers of our time. Uh, so I, I, the resources are out there uh, to educate ourselves. Uh, I would, I, I recommend in particular, uh, probably someone that uh, Boris knows also, uh, my friend Jim Forrest, uh, who uh, was uh, very close to Henry Nouwen. And I think one of the, the great teachers of nonviolence of our, of our time, he died uh, in January of this year in, in, in Holland, uh, where he lived. Uh, he was a former editor of the Catholic Worker. He was a close friend of Thomas Merton. He was a founder of the Catholic Peace Fellowship. He became Russian Orthodox and became a director of the Russian of the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. So, in this particular time, I would be so wishing that I could hear his wisdom about this. His own parish, uh, where he was buried, uh, was among the Russian Orthodox churches that uh, defected from uh, uh, the authority of the uh, Russian Patriarch and affiliated with the Byzantine Patriarch. Uh, that is uh, a sign of that has been uh, widespread. I think of 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 many people of very various traditions uh, really rising up to challenge even their shepherds 
uh, who are not uh, uh, speaking a word of peace. Uh, but Jim Forrest uh, wrote uh, about a dozen books on peace, including biographies of Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Tignat Han, uh, Daniel Berrigan, and his own memoir about his journey of peace. Uh, and among the, his particularly, uh, I think, important books was a book called Loving Your Enemies, uh, Reflections on the Hardest Commandment. Uh, he also uh, wrote a book called "The uh, The Root of War Is Is uh, Fear," uh, drawing on Thomas Merton's uh, message of peacemaking. Uh, so, in my life, uh, my education in peace has come very much from uh, listening to great peacemakers and spiritual teachers like that. Uh, and I uh, can think of no better way, uh, including. Uh, uh, Henry Nowen's writings on, on uh, we did a published it almost everybody I quoted uh, this evening was from a, a book published at Orbis, including uh, Peacemaking by Henry Nowen, uh, and also The Road to Peace, edited by John Deere, that was a collection of Henry's uh, writings on peace. Uh, uh, Henry, as, as Boris knows very well, uh, made a uh, went on a pilgrimage to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I was very, I was very uh, moved and touched to see that the articles uh, that came from that, which he actually invited me to publish. I didn't really think it was uh, mattered to a book, and I, I passed on it. And, and now it's been uh, published in Ukrainian. I was very moved to see uh, the picture of you presenting a copy of that book to uh, President Zelensky. Uh, and uh, I, I, so I, I think of these 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 people like like Henry, like uh, Jim Forrest, uh, Merton, uh, Dorothy Day. That I know, uh, you know that that they would uh, have wisdom to share with us about, about this situation, not maybe always uh, a practical, but as Misha said, would certainly be calling us, first of all, to, to prayer and compassion and solidarity uh, with those who are suffering. Thank you, Robert. We had allotted 90 minutes for tonight and we're right up against the wire of almost nine o'clock, almost two hours. So we are gonna to have to wrap things up. Sister Mary Ellen Francoeur, um, who you just met is a member of our Voices for Peace team. And we've asked if she would offer a closing prayer. Thank you again, Paul. I, I just believe that um, if, as Robert said, the teachings of Jesus have often been completely distorted and lost, um, that we've been awakened this evening to a return, to listen, to go deeper, um, and, to, and to ask those difficult questions about what does this really mean today? in the context of today, when we're facing so many different aspects of violence in our world. So um, if I go right to the prayer to try and draw this together, uh, I would ask us to, uh, to bring ourselves into the presence of our God into the heart and mind and vision and dream of God. Gracious God of peace, we thank you for this time of reflection on the way of peace. May we remain open to the call to the radical nature of peacemaking. And may we be blessed for the journey. Blessed with humility in witnessing to your vision of peace. Blessed with wisdom in discerning the way of peace for each moment, including the moment of war. Blessed with courage to move through fear, to love of all, even our enemies. And to be blessed with surrender to your power working in us 
which can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, thank all of you. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Hallelujah! Uh, Woo! <laughs> my, uh, my apologies to uh, some of our speakers who I pushed to um, wrap up a little earlier than what they had anticipated, uh, but we have so little time to do all the things that we wanted to do today. Uh, to uh, those in our audience, uh, we had a number of different perspectives. And I know from some of the comments that came up, some perspectives that some of you found um, difficult to, uh, to embrace. I think one of our challenges as peacemakers is to be able to find um, the truth in what's being said and hold on to that uh, truth from each one of our speakers. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. We're humbled and energized to think so many of you are willing to set aside your plans to, to participate in this important conversation. We'll follow up in the next few days to ask your feedback on the evening. Thank you, Robert Ellsberg, Archbishop Kudziak, Joanne Jefferson, Willard Metzger, and Misha Berger gossman for being with us this evening and offering your insights and wisdom and to Das Sidney and Mary Ellen Francoeur for helping us frame the discussion in the spirit of prayer. Thank you also to our partners on Renowan Society, Citizens for Public Justice, Canadian Council of Churches, International Thomas Merton Society, Religions for Peace Canada, and the Church of the Redeemer in Toronto for making this gathering a reality. And to Blaise Pascal for her, both her creative work and her technical work to make tonight a reality also. One final reminder, don't forget to click on the donate button if you would like to assist us with the cost of this gathering. Again, thank you so much and peace be with you. <laughs>